right. Uh, so we will, uh, this is the last talk of the day, so I will go super, super quick so we can all get to some tasty pizza after this. So we're going to do two slides and then we're done. <laughs> Uh, so whatever he wants. Uh, so we're gonna <laughs> we still gotta wait for pizza. Shoot, ah, now you listen to me talk. Uh, so uh, this afternoon I'm gonna talk about uh, binding Tigara uh, with Luigit and Luigit's Epify capabilities. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Robert. Uh, Pop Rocks is my handle. I'm one of the team leads here at Kong. Uh, I've contributed to Open Recipe, Plot Security. Nginx, and when I say contributed, I mean I submitted one patch and they shot it down in like five minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I know that's a lot more true than I care to admit. Uh, previously, I was with Greenmost as a security engineer, um, and ZenEdge as well. Uh, and ZenEdge is actually uh, the employer that I did this work for. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, Yara a little bit. Yara it builds itself as the pattern matching Swiss Army knife. Uh, it's primarily used in malware research. More generically, uh, it's just a pattern description library. Basically, like grep on steroids, but if those steroids were like soaked in even more steroids. Uh, Yara, uh, at its heart, is really just an API, much like Lua. There's command line utilities, um, but underneath it, its API is treated as a first class citizen. We're going to dig into that more as we go on. Uh, it is multi platform. There are builds available for uh, OS X, uh, Linux, Windows, if you hate yourself. Um, under the hood, it really runs on a data driven design uh, with uh, a simple and extensible DSL. Uh, we're going to walk into that uh, under the hood, like I said, using its API. It reads in rule sets uh, and does your pattern matching based on that. So the behavior of Yara uh, really all depends on how you define your rules. Yara rules consist of a set of strings and a Boolean expression uh, to match based on what your strings look like. Uh, so if you think, like a, going back to the, the grep on steroids comment, if you're just grepping through something, you're looking for one expression uh, inside of a search target that's typically a text file. Uh, Yara takes that out and gives you a lot more functionality with that same concept. You define strings that are uh, either case sensitive or case insensitive. They may have wild cards. They may be regular expressions. Uh, they could be binary data. You can just provide uh, strings of, of hex data or human readable ASCII strings to provide. Uh, you can define one or more of these inside of a rule set as well as custom module logic that we'll touch on briefly. We didn't really have any use for it. Uh, but the API does provide you a way to <coughs> extend uh, Yara's searching uh, to whatever logic you want to write if you want to do your own module searching. Uh, so there's more than one. Uh, oh, sorry, more slide. Uh, so Yara rules are in a human readable DSL that get compiled down uh, to a binary format before they're executed against. Uh, as I mentioned, strings can be uh, ASCII text or just hex strings. Those hex strings can also include wildcards. So if you're searching for a string of bytes, and one or more bytes in a row, maybe any particular value or a subset of values that can be defined as well. Um, strings, as I mentioned, can also be uh, regular expressions. Yara doesn't use PCRE or RE2 or anything like that. It builds its own regex engine uh, that's designed primarily for speed uh, instead of a full feature set that you would find with something like PCRE. Uh, so there's no capture groups, there's no backtracking, which means no look ahead or look behind, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but again, it means you typically have uh, a much faster search time, and you don't have run into potential cases of exponential backtracking. Uh, we're really running into a catastrophic situation. Uh, no POSIX character classes, but things like uh, you know reading versus uh, lazy matching, wildcard, things like that. Most of the basic stuff that you would find uh, in a regular expression engine, you can expect to find with with Yara. Uh, so that's the first half of it, which is all the bullet points, and the second <laughs> point is the condition, which defines after you define all of your strings. Any number of regular expressions, uh, binary searches, uh, X-strings lookup, things like that. Uh, a condition that determines whether or not, given this particular set of strings and given this particular match condition, does this rule match? And then if a rule matches, uh, essentially nothing happens. Yara is a, a passion tool used for detection. It's not typically used for any sort of inline behavior. Uh, we're going to get to that in a second. Yara rules can also be provided with metadata, tags, namespaces, as well as any arbitrary identifying information that you would like to provide, uh, authors, um, pretty much any key value pair that you can think of. Uh, as I mentioned, Yara rules are compiled down to a binary format with the Yara C utility. This, like the Yara utility, the command line utility that you'll find in the package, uh, just uses the C API under the hood. Uh, multiple rule sets can also be compiled down uh, into a single binary rule set. So if you just you know, Yara C, path to file one, file two, file three, Everything gets blocked down into a single binary rule set that can then be loaded up by the API. Uh, in addition to regular expression, uh, uh, string matching, uh, things like that, there's also some miscellaneous uh, functionality that Yara provides. You can look for uh, any particular file size, 
uh, looking for more advanced training behaviors like repetition, match count, things like that. Uh, there are modules for portable executables uh, and DLF file types, uh, as well as guests on MIME types like what you would find with the file command utility, uh, byte offset functionality, uh, and rule back reference. So you can write a rule that matches under certain conditions if other rules in your rule sets match as well, and that allows you to provide uh, more of a, a complex matching facility than what you would find with against something like rep uh, or other basic searching utilities. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is also a development API, so if you wanted to uh, do something like extend the portable executable searching module or write your own or your own custom logic, uh, that's available for you as well. We didn't, again, we didn't really have any use for it. The, the basic Yara functionality suited our needs, um, which we're going to get into in a second, but if you're looking to do really, really powerful pattern matching uh, that, that extensibility is a huge plus for using Yara. So this is an example rule. I know the screen is, is kind of tiny, so we're going to walk through this relatively briefly. Um, but again, there's, there's metadata here that I mentioned. Um, there are strings. There's a few different examples. Uh, one is a regular expression. Um, I guess I should point out what this rule does. First, this looks for uh, PHP text or PHP uh, characters in what ostensibly reports to be an image file. So if you have something that looks like a ping or a GIF or a JPEG or something like that, um, but it also contains PHP code trying to get around really junky web servers and things like that. This would be a rule to match something that looks like that. Uh, so our, our string conditions, uh, we have uh, a, a string called uh, GIF, uh, which is a regular expression that looks for a GIF header, um, and then JPEG and ping headers that are hex strings that I mentioned, um, as well as a, a string PHP tag that just has the PHP opening block characters. And then our condition block uh, tells us how uh, under what situations we would consider this rule match. So uh, the condition syntax is, is pretty human readable, which I really like with using Yara rules. It's not a lot of arbitrary characters and whatnot. It's, it's really human readable. As we look at some complex rules, we'll see that more and more. So this condition says that essentially one of the first three things has to match. We have to match this string called GIF at byte offset zero, or I don't know why they called it JFIF instead of JPEG, uh, or PNG gate zero. So one of, one of these three matches has to occur at byte offset zero. And we have to find our PHP tag, which again is just the opening block PHP, somewhere in that. Uh, if we meet uh, those two conditions, so basically one of these three ORs and our final AND, uh, then this rule will be considered a match. This is a more uh, complex rule example that matches uh, the Dirty Cow exploit that came out last year. I'm not going to walk through all of this, but again, this has examples of uh, hex off strings, uh, hex offsets, uh, and strings. And again, you can see it's a little bit hard to see because the screen is so small. Uh, but there's wildcard functionality inside of uh, the hex sets. Uh, uh, regular expressions as well as um, uh, plain strings. And then the condition becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, so again, there's byte offset matching uh, is this line um, and then several other alternative clauses. Um, one of the things that I want to point out, uh, if you look at some of the string names, you'll see they're uh, prepended with variables. Uh, these top two are, you see A1 and then B2, B3, or B1 and B2. Um, and part of the condition is B star. Um, I'm going to figure out how to make my R shadow thing work here. Um, so we can see uh, the, the second clause in the condition is all of B star. So that means every rule that starts with the letter B would have to get matched. This allows you to, to really start to get granular with <coughs> um, And then the complexity just goes on and on and on and on. There's mention of file size matching here. Um, the conditions get really, really complicated. So have fun trying to wrap your brain around that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's some more additional uh, match functionality, uh, rule back references, um, as well as matching external data that you can provide to the API with call uh, and iterating over strings. We'll look at brief examples of those. Uh, so this is an example of rule iteration, so uh, conditions can have a for loop, um, and you can use that to adjust by offsets um, and do searches based on that. So this rule will look for dummy one and dummy two in certain offset positions within the match, uh, or the target, excuse me. Second uh, simple dummy example of matching a rule. So we have a first dummy rule that matches if it finds a string dummy one, um, and rule two that matches uh, under our condition A, which means the string needs to include the string, uh, the target needs to include the string dummy two, and we need to have matched rule one. And our final example, uh, a handful of examples of just defining uh, external variables. These would typically be passed uh, as external data through the API uh, or through a command line flag if you're using the command line utility. Uh, so using Yara uh, out of the box is really simple. It's just Yara, the path to the rules, uh, and the path to the target. Uh, if the rules file that's defined as the first option hasn't been compiled down, 
the command line utility will detect that, compile it for you, uh, and then run through the execution. The CLI options are somewhat extensive. You can recursively scan through directory, uh, filter out targets based on previously defined metadata, namespacing, tags, things of that nature, um, and then importing any custom data that you might have for custom modules and metadata that you've written for your custom rule sets as things start to expand out. For most common Yara examples, um, if you can just search like open source Yara rules repositories, custom modules and things like that don't really apply. Um, but again, this is one of the things that I like about using Yara is it gives you the flexibility to really build on it if you so need to. Um, Yara, being that it's API as a first class citizen, has a binding uh, Python, is what it really has, but the community has also written bindings for Ruby, uh, Go, Java, and then Lua, huzzah, which is why I can justify talking to you guys today. So great, we have this command line malware scanning utility. Um, what does this have to do with Lua? Well, it's an edge, uh, we ran a uh, reverse proxy uh, cloud environment, you distributed, uh, everything was running on OpenResty. We had a use case for thinking, all right, well, we have WAF solutions, uh, we have other security measures like uh, rate limiting in place and whatnot. What if we wanted to do a deeper look uh, with customers who uh, are exposing file uploads uh, to their end users and people have cases where they want to search for uh, malicious files being uploaded to a server, or potentially scan for um, malicious data being present in a download, say somehow a site got hijacked and we wanted to be able to, to scan through the response body and uh, examine it, potentially you know, alert a customer if, you know, hey, you, now you're serving up a web shell or you're serving up a uh, JavaScript that's known to be malicious. Uh, so we wanted to explore that. Um, Using existing research data sets, so again, online uh, YAR rule sets that you can find from the community, um, as well as partnerships with commercial third party providers that we had. Uh, typically, like I mentioned, this sort of thing is, is out of band. Virus scanning is typically expensive, uh, and it's, as I mentioned, uh, it's typically passive detection. With all of the YAR functionality that we found, there, there's no action. There's strings and conditions. So either your rule matched or it didn't, but YAR doesn't actually do anything with this data. And typically, that's what you find if you go to like virus total. You will upload a file and they will tell you this matched or it didn't match. It doesn't actually do anything with that. So we said, all right, what if we can actually do something with this? Because uh, Yara has a C API, because we could FFI the thing, we figured this would probably be pretty straightforward. We wanted to leverage this into our existing edge tier platform. Again, everything's running on uh, OpenRSD and LuaJit. It was already uh, a pretty fleshed out development environment. Uh, for writing Lua modules and extending out uh, the middleware framework that we provided. Um, so we had the ability to integrate essentially anything that would run well with OpenRSD that provided an API in C. The goal here uh, was to make sure that we were focusing on performance. Uh, we wanted to use pre-compiled rules and make sure that we weren't having to run through the same rule compilation on every request and wasting CPU cycles. Uh, we spent a lot of time benchmarking uh, with a lot of the system tap and staff plus plus tool sets to make sure that we weren't inducing any unnecessary latency in the request. Obviously, some sort of these scans are going to be pretty non-trivial, uh, especially with larger rule sets, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't adding any uh, unnecessary latency and really keeping things tight where we could. Uh, we also wanted to avoid uh, buffering to disk uh, when possible uh, with Nginx, making sure that everything, the request bodies were staying in memory and that we were looking at streaming responses and not uh, buffering responses to disk when possible. There is some challenge in this because we had to integrate into an existing ecosystem, so there were other modules and other teams that also had a say in how these nodes were configured. So some of that didn't really go to plan. Uh, one of our goals with writing rules that when we were writing custom rules uh, and not using existing rule sets, uh, were basically just to follow community guidelines. So anybody who's done pattern matching knows that regular expressions, even when they're optimized, even when you're pre-compiling um, and using all sorts of shiny, <laughs> fancy nginx.rc or nginx.re dot match, uh, optimization is still going to be slower. It's going to be a lot slower than a flat screen search. Um, and byte offsets and hex searches are even faster than that. So when we were looking at writing rules, we wanted to make sure that we, we followed this as much as possible. Case insensitive strings uh, are also really important. When Yara does string searching, it has a concept of what's called an atom, which is typically a four byte or so element of the string. Uh, when you use case sensitive string definitions, you now have to create atom for each permutation of the string. When you have a case insensitive string definition, you only have to have one atom for each four byte chunk. Uh, we also wanted to avoid short strings, less than six bytes or so, because those were just going to generate way too many false positives. Uh, in the designing uh, rules, we wanted to make sure that we were following, again, community guidelines, best practices, uh, existing standards for how rules were developed. We're not model researchers, uh, we were a cloud security company, so we wanted to focus on that. We also wanted to make sure. 
um, that any results that we got from this was being exposed not only to our SOC um, and our logging platforms, but also being exposed to customers as well. So when people had traffic interrupted uh, or needed metrics on what sort of security we were providing, that we were able to take that data uh, from our, our ER integration and expose that out and not just say, eh, 403 requests not allowed, too bad, we're not going to tell you why. So that was an important uh, goal for us in, in designing this integration as well. Jumping into the C API a little bit, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the API is the first class citizen. Everything from initialization, rule compilation, actually doing the execution, finalizing, thread handling, everything is done through the API. Uh, the command line utilities that are provided are really just thin wrappers around this functionality. YAR provides a few different ways to scan data, uh, either memory buffers, just passing in, um, I think they're unsigned integer pointers under the hood. Uh, you can also pass uh, an on-disk file, a path, or a file descriptor to YAR, and that will be scanned all three of those will give you the same results, uh, no matter how you get that data passed in. This is an example uh, of one of the scanning functions, so this would scan a memory buffer. Uh, it takes a, a handful of arguments, the first is, uh, a pointer to a rule script that's been pre-compiled, uh, your buffer that you're scanning is the size of the buffer, uh, a flags placeholder, uh, pretty much aren't any flags used in Yara at this time, this is really just an API placeholder, um, and then a callback function, and this is where we're going to really run into problems in our design, we'll get to that in the next slide. Um, callback takes also a void pointer that can be used, um, and then just a timeout function. So this, uh, all three of the scanning API functions, uh, memory scan, file descriptor, and on disk path, take pretty much the same format, uh, except for whether or not it's a buffer or path, whatever have you. This push style design was really, really problematic though, as you can see, so when we call scan mem or scan file descriptor, the callback that we define is gonna get run on every rule execution. Not every rule match, every rule execution. Um, and that becomes a huge problem. Uh, as we can see from the Lumager website, that says callbacks are slow. Do not use callbacks for performance sensitive work. So when we were looking at this and we thought, all right, we have, jumping ahead now, we're in a bit of a crossroad because we have an API that we want to use in the hot path with really performance sensitive work. We can't use callbacks and go from Lua to C back to Lua, but the API tells us that we have to call back, which means going from C or Lua to C back to Lua. So we have three things and we can only pick two. So what do we do? Don't use callbacks as we drop uh, jumping calling back from C back into Lua. So the solution for us was to actually write a thin C library that obscure all of this. Uh, essentially what we ended up doing was writing a wrapper in C around the entire Yara API process as a single function and calling that one time, rather than having to jump from Lua to C to Lua, and then to Lua to C to Lua over and over and over again for tens or hundreds of thousands of rules that we might have. Uh, we ended up writing a really thin wrapper uh, statically compiling in Yara, um, and then distributing that to part of our platform, and then using FFI uh, to load that shared object. Uh, and getting rid of this push style design, where now we're just making a single call to our custom function that abstracts the Yara functionality in C, but still gives us the same functionality at the end of the call. So we need something to wrap the whole thing. Initializing Yara, loading rule sets that have been pre-compiled, scanning either uh, a memory or a file path if the request had been buffered to disk, uh, finalizing everything and then being able to pass our state as well as any match data back up to our caller in the loop. So we needed to write a wrapper that handled all of this uh, and did it fairly quickly. Uh, and this was the first not significant um, but non-trivial work that I had done in C. So this was actually a little bit of fun to play around with basic things um, that C developers would find really trivial. But for somebody that does Lua development, being able to work a little bit more with understanding how symbols get statically compiled into an object, how that FFI plays with this. This was a fun learning opportunity, really, just to play around, as well as actually functionally introducing something useful into our ecosystem. So we defined, uh, in order to, to handle our state, we defined a couple of small structs. Uh, the first, uh, I call this library Yara wrap, because Yara, a wrapper around Yara, and I'm not a creative person at all, so we ended up with a small library called Yara wrap. Uh, the, the first struct that we defined is a user data type, uh, this is, uh, this contains just a few small elements to count of how many matches we had. Uh, Multicap tells us whether or not we want to search for more than one match or if we just want to bail out with the first rule match that we find. Um, and then a pointer to a custom struct, uh, which is basically just a wrapper for uh, a linked list of uh, chart pointers. Nothing really crazy. All we're doing with the, the wrap match is gathering the name of the rule that we matched, 
um, and setting that up in a link list and then passing that bubbling back back up um, to our label column through our C wrapper. So calling this integrating it into open recipe, we had a, a couple of goals. We wanted a really simple little interface. Um, we wanted to return a couple of variables, whether or not we match. And if we did match uh, the names of all of the rules that we had, uh, we didn't care about returning rule metadata or anything like that because that could be looked up by the SOC uh, or any logging facilities at a later point in time. So we wanted to keep this wrapper really good really and um, I had mentioned whether or not we wanted to handle this buffer request bodies. Initially, we didn't for performance concerns. Um, but it turned out to be a non-negotiable with working with our infrastructure. So we needed to write a wrapper that would scan both memory buffers that we would have to cast to from Lua, um, as well as just pointing to the request buffer path, which thankfully there is a very simple open OpenOS API for getting that happening. Uh, so this is an example of the Lua caller. We would load up uh, our Lua library, called Yara. Um, the message is if you want to return uh, the names of all the rules, you would define a table that would be passed into the function, um, and then define the path to the pre-compiled binary rules uh, that would exist on disk. You would read the body. Uh, this is an example of getting the body file if you know uh, that it hasn't been held in memory and it's been buffered up to disk, um, and then call uh, inspect file given the path of the body, the rule path, and our empty table that's going to contain uh, the messages, uh, if we find any messages. And it will be up to the table or the caller to make sure that this table is empty with every execution, uh, which is why in this dumb example, uh, it's just redeclared here every iteration. Obviously, for performance reasons, if you just keep the same table uh, and call table out clear on it, it would be a little bit faster. Really simple example here. Uh, so inspect file returns just a single value of Boolean of whether or not a match was found. And if it was matched, then we would iterate over uh, every match in our matches table. And this value is not correct. This should be uh, messages, not matches. So nobody uses this because it's not actually going to work. <laughs> so well, I did this back in February um, and didn't really pay much attention to it for probably six months or so. And then as I was reviewing the code and trying to refresh my memory and everything I did, I realized there was a really a lot of amount of work that I, I would have liked to, to improve with this. So uh, the next five slides are all basically things that I did wrong with this. Um, which I think is probably the, the best um, experience that I've gotten out of this is being able to dive into something uh, in an area where I didn't have a lot of experience with doing writing C um, and interacting in a slightly different environment and then trying to glue that all together with Lua. Being able to come back to that six months later has been a really, really valuable uh, experience for me. Um, so I mentioned that we didn't want to uh, return any metadata in our thin wrapper because that could be looked up by our SOC or any logging facilities. Uh, writing a more general purpose library, and I said I think that would have been a lot more uh, valuable. There's also more metadata that we could have uh, returned, like execution timing, that would have been great for profiling, uh, particularly in a, a large sort of heterogeneous uh, infrastructure where we're running on multiple cloud providers, multiple different hardware specs, being able to understand what rules took the longest amount of time would be really useful for SOC admins. Um, probably the worst design choice that I made while writing this was the link list in our custom struct that we had uh, was allocated on demand with every match, uh, which meant it had to be freed after every match, which is really, really inefficient. It's a total waste of, of mount and free. Um, and that free was currently done in Lua because of the design of the wrapper I wrote, which is probably one of the most embarrassing things I've written. And I don't know why I'm putting it up in public, but hey! <laughs> Now we can all learn from a mistake. Um, so just noting, uh, we have a, a value that we declare. Um, essentially, what this code walks through is if we found a match, um, so if our user data uh, count was greater than zero, which had been incremented by our, our C wrapper, uh, we consider our match true, and then we need to walk through uh, and basically free uh, every part of, or every match struct that we found. Um, so this is just essentially uh, an exercise in walking through and freeing all the elements of a linked list uh, in Lua. Again, in hindsight, this is a really, really terrible design, uh, and I'm kind of embarrassed that we didn't spend a couple extra hours of playing around and pre-allocating buffer data for this instead of mounting and freeing on every request. But I mean, how often do you get to call free? I mean, if you do that, you're totally doing something right. <laughs> Uh, other things that I'd like to do in the future with this um, would be expanding uh, on, on some of the feature parity that the CLI tool provides, um, being able to filter 
uh, requests based on tags or metadata exported or importing external variables. None of that's available in our wrapper. Again, we wrote the, the thinnest wrapper that we could just for performance on a use case that was, we only care about a binary state and some very, very limited metadata. Um, for Again, for a full-fledged wrapper that would be open source, I, I'd like to be able to expand this out in the future. Um, there's other CLI features uh, like a, a fast mode, which again, um, will uh, try to short circuit uh, some of the matching logic uh, inside of the Yara Guts. We never really did any experiments with this uh, to see if it made any performance difference. We never bothered turning it on, but exposing this would be really, really nice. Um, this is an example of some of the features that we don't have. So doing a match, if you call Yara-T, um, that will only search for rules that have that particular tag. Uh, in this case, it's a tag called Packer. Uh, in this case, that actually defines just arbitrary variables um, that you can pass into the API calls. So not having this in, I think, limits our wrapper. Um, but again, at the time that we wrote it, it was a trade-off between performance and flexibility. Circling back to this, I think it would be a lot of fun uh, to not only refactor the design, but really expand out of functionality as well. Um, the, the, other, the other few things that we you know, I'd like to do um, is add a wrapper to scan a file descriptor. Um, Currently, I don't think that would be much use in OpenRSD um, until Dominator actually finally gets that three-year-old PR in and we have file descriptors in OpenRSD. Um, the other thing um, that I would like to add out would be wrappers um, and bindings for rule compilation. Um, in our design, um, rules will be pre-compiled um, at some other point in your deployment pipeline and then shipped out to the node. Um, again, largely because we didn't need to provide a little interface to actually compile those. Uh, through a binding, we didn't do that, but as part of you know, fully fleshing out a lid, uh, that's something that I think I would like to see in the future. Um, one of the, the tricks that I ran into was um, the fact that some of the structs, um, and I might have been just misreading it at the time, but a lot of the, the way that Yara defines its structs um, didn't, were kind of transparent, they weren't opaque structs, so I had trouble um, having to redefine everything through epify.cdef and it got too ugly and nasty. Um, I have a feeling that I did something wrong at that point, so that would be something that I would like to come through, uh, you know, sort of reevaluate. Um, and if the the Yara rule structs um, and the internal guts of the Yara can be more easily accessed through FFI, uh, that means we could probably reduce the footprint of our C wrapper and just more closely align uh, the binding to the FFI directly instead of through a custom C wrapper. <coughs> So that's it. Again, short talk because we all want to get pizza and beer. Uh, any questions? Questions, questions, questions. <laughs>